I'm Matthew Delaney. I'm an emergency physician. I am the host of the podcast, ERCast. And today I wanna to walk you through the top five things that as an emergency physician, I don't do because I think they're too risky. Up front, my disclaimer is I like to do risky things. That being said, I think there are things that a lot of us do regularly where there is an elevated level of risk, but we might not be aware of. It. So number five, my kids hate this, but trampoline parks. These things honestly are pretty fun. But really, if you look at 2004, in the US, there was one trampoline park. Currently, there are over 1,500, so we're seeing a whole lot more trampoline parks across the country and actually worldwide. As the number of parks has increased, the injuries have gone up. And there was a study that looked from 2010 to 2014 and found that in 2010, there were 600 injuries associated with trampoline parks. Just by 2014, that number is up to 7,000, and the numbers are getting bigger and bigger each year. So there's certainly a problem here. I know what you're gonna say though, are trampoline parks more dangerous than backyard trampolines? And the literature is tricky. So if you look at everybody that's injured related to a trampoline, the majority of the people that come to the emergency department are injured on backyard trampolines. Now that doesn't mean that backyard trampolines are more dangerous, it just means that they're more abundant. Everybody knows somebody that has a backyard trampoline. When you look at the kind of granular details of the literature though, trampoline parks seem to pose an enhanced risk of injury. So if you look at trampoline parks compared to backyard trampolines, the chance that you're gonna get a fracture or dislocation is much higher. It's 46% of injuries from trampoline parks involve a fracture or dislocation compared to about 17% from home trampolines. So you're more likely to get injured in a trampoline park. You're more likely to have a fracture or a dislocation. And if you get injured in a trampoline park versus a home trampoline, you're more likely to have surgery. In fact, 23% of trampoline park-induced injuries end up needing a surgery compared to about 11% of home trampoline injuries. So we're seeing a lot more trampoline park injuries. The rates of fracture and dislocation are higher, and the chance that you need an operation if you get hurt at a trampoline park goes up. Number four, this is gonna make people mad. I don't touch raw oysters, but these are really popular. And so let's talk about what's the risk associated with raw oysters. And it's the risk of getting bacterial infections. And Vibrio is the bacteria we worry the most about. Vibrio is a bacteria that lives largely in warm water. And if you look across the US, there are about 80,000 cases a year of Vibrio associated with raw oysters. Now, most of these, it's upset stomach, kind of classic food poisoning symptoms, but there's a subtype of Vibrio, Vibrio vulnificus, that is a very bad player. In fact, there are about 100 fatalities each year from Vibrio vulnificus. And so if you get Vibrio vulnificus, the chance that you die is about 20% per case. So you're out there eating oysters. Number one, they're disgusting. Number two, you're just waiting to see if you happen to get the oyster that has Vibrio, and worst case, has Vibrio vulnificus. One of the other problems with oysters is there are a lot of myths out there that I've heard people say, I've even said some of these, that involve, can we mitigate the risk associated with oysters? One of the things that gets said a lot is, well, I get my oysters from a clean place. The water's not as polluted as other places. That is, in general, I would say, get the less polluted food. But the problem is that Vibrio is largely a product of being in warm water. It's not directly related to pollution. So you may have oysters from cleaner water. That's not been shown to decrease the chance that you could expose to Vibrio. One of the other myths, and this is an old myth that I heard growing up in Mobile, Alabama, is that you gotta watch out for raw oysters in any month that doesn't have an R. So the warm weather months, May, June, July, August. Generally, it's thought, well, the water's warm, there's probably more Vibrio. So we stay away from oysters then, yet out of season, when it's cooler, it should be safer to eat oysters. That's not true at all. The literature tells us that if the month has an R in it, so the fall, winter, and early spring months, about 40% of cases of Vibrio occur during those months. So is it a little safer? Maybe, doesn't mitigate the risk. One of the other things this is, okay, well, maybe raw oysters pose a threat to us, but I'm not gonna eat a lot of raw oysters. It really gets into almost playing Russian roulette with raw oysters because there are fatal cases of Vibrio vulnificus that have been associated after eating just three oysters. So for me, it's easy to move past raw oysters. Number three is road biking. I used to love road biking, but then I had a car almost hit me and I thought this seems kind of dangerous. So I dug in. I think road biking is too dangerous for me to do. The most recent literature tells us you are 48 times more likely to be killed on a road bike compared to a car per kilometer traveled. I don't like those stats at all. So can I mitigate the risk some? Maybe. So it's very clear that if you bike in safer countries or safer areas, the risk of dying goes down. For instance, 
your chance of dying in the US on a bike is three times what you see in Germany and it's six times what you see in the Netherlands. So other countries do have safer approaches and generally that's having dedicated bike lanes. But that being said, when you really push the literature, when it comes to road biking, this idea that I can be safe is probably a myth. And the idea that I can avoid an accident, it, you're not the problem. I wasn't the problem. It's the people driving down the road that don't care about road bikers. That's the problem. And we see that in the literature. When you look at fatal bike accidents in the US, the cyclist was thought to be at fault only 10% of the time. So 90% of the time you're out there trying to get in shape, trying to look good in that tight little suit you wear and another car takes you out. It's not the mistakes we're making. To piggyback on that, number two, again, this is one that people really get frustrated with. I don't ride motorcycles. I've done it a couple times before. I'll be very clear. I think motorcycles are incredibly fun. But when we're talking about motorcycles, the risk like road biking is elevated and I don't think we can do a lot to mitigate it. So if we look at the risks of riding a motorcycle, motorcycles account for about 3% of vehicles in the US, but they're involved in about 14% of fatal accidents. Your risk per mile traveled is less than road biking, but it's about 27 times more likely you'll die per mile traveled on a motorcycle compared to a car. If you don't die, the injury rate is staggering. So if you're in a motorcycle accident, there's an 80% chance you're injured compared to 20% injury rate in cars. So cars are less likely to kill you. Cars are less likely to injure you. And kind of like we talked about with road biking, you'll talk to people who love motorcycling and they'll say, I do it safely. I wear a helmet. I do it in good weather. I don't drink and drive my motorcycle. I'm mostly on surface streets. I'm not on the interstate or the freeway. And the problem is that all of those things, picking safer streets, not drinking, helmet use, good weather, all of those things are not associated with a lower risk of having a fatal accident. In fact, most motorcycle accidents occur when people are doing the right things, riding under the safest possible circumstances. So motorcycles for me, I get it, they're fun. I just don't think the risk is worth it. Let's wrap up with one that's gonna anger a lot of people. I told my wife I was gonna talk about this. She didn't like it. My kids don't like this, putting our feet on the dashboard. I get it, it's relaxing, it changed position on a long car ride. People do this, you can't go on the interstate and not see somebody cruising down the road on their phone in the passenger seat, feet on the dashboard. I think there's weird 90s country songs based around putting your feet on the dashboard and setting off to the wide open spaces. We gotta stop doing this and this is why. There was a study that they did where they did a simulated front impact collision. The car was going about 43 miles an hour. So not the slowest impact, but pretty similar to what you'd see on the interstate if somebody slams on the brakes and you rear in them. So moderate mechanism. And they found that if you had your feet on the dashboard, and they did this using crash test dummies, when your feet were on the dashboard, the chance that you jacked up your pelvis, hips, and legs is much, much higher, whether that's from the dashboard or from the airbag going off. But you get this really, really increased risk of horrible injuries to the lower body that you don't see in similar tests under similar circumstances when the person or the crash test dummy is sitting. So there's the risk of bony injury. But what I didn't realize, which is yet another reason not to put our feet on the dashboard, is there's this risk of injured the spinal cord and abdomen. And if you look what happens when we put our feet on the dashboard, we're kind of changing the whole way that our seatbelt would engage us if it has to catch us because there's a deceleration. And what happens is the seatbelt will rise up higher. So rather than kind of pushing on the bony pelvis, you're getting a lot more pressure on the abdomen. So the rate of fatal abdominal injuries and spinal cord injuries goes up significantly when you're in this atypical position with your feet on the dashboard. It's interesting when they break down who gets these injuries, it's generally somebody on a long family road trip and women are more likely to get this injury compared to men. I think in part because I don't think I could get my legs on a dashboard to save my life. I'm not flexible. My legs are long enough that I just sit there awkwardly with them shoved under the dashboard. So we really have to stop of all of these other things. If you love trampoline parks and that's something you gotta do, go for it, I guess. It's much riskier than doing something in the backyard. Just stop with raw oysters. I don't wanna hear any feedback on that. Road biking, cycling are both activities that a lot of us do, a lot of us enjoy. They're no's for me, but maybe the risk can be mitigated a little bit. But when it comes to feet on the dashboard, this is an easy one. Significantly increased risk of something bad happening to you. You're basically taking away the seatbelt's ability to safely stop you if you decelerate. I get it, it's comfortable. Please, 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 no more feet on the dashboard. This is Hippo Education.